Welcome to Metro Cable Network. My name is Michael Rainville, and I'm proud to host today some local artists from Northeast Minneapolis. So let's just jump right into this great interview, and I have Josh Blanc, who is the president of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District. And Josh, can you tell us a little bit about the district and, of course, about yourself? Yeah, I am Josh Blanc, and uh, yep, I am the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District president. Uh, I've been that, we have now been a, an official organization for just over a year, but it's been, the Arts District has been around since 2003. So we have been sort of building up the capacity of what the district is, the banners that go around the entire community, the logos, the tagline of Arts at Work, basically just trying to understand this big swath of land that is the city designated as the Arts District. So Josh, can you give us a little bit of history about the Northeast Arts District? You say it's a big swath of land, so there's actual physical boundaries? Correct, yes. So they go from the river up to Central Avenue, and they go from 26th Avenue over to Broadway. All in the heart of Northeast. It is. Probably the largest arts district in the country, uh, just because of the sheer scale of the size of that. The city designated it mainly because there was a developer at the time that was trying to take over an arts building and change it into something else, and then the city was able to recognize that we needed the artists that had moved from downtown, and they kicked out during the sports stadium uh, world, at that time and they resettled in Northeast Minneapolis. So so that was the start of these uh, magnificent industrial buildings uh, being converted to an arts use. They were here earlier and Art of World had started a few years before that. So Art of World is now in its 20th year. So it was about seven years before that the artists had been really being active and people had seen what they were doing through Art of World. And that had started with 30 artists and Every year it sort of exponentially went up uh, to 60, then to 120, and mm. now we're at 600 to 800 artists that just participate in Art World itself. And that's the Northeast Minneapolis Arts Association that, Correct. that uh, does such a wonderful job in organizing that and promoting that. Right, yeah, I mean, they were the beginning stages of all the artists coming together, and Sarah was there with us, and you know we both were on the board at different times, and so a lot of artists have been helping sort of uh, navigate what we're dealing with mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how do we make an arts district work to its full capacity. And you had mentioned Sarah over here, which is really kind of our special focus today. You've done this wonderful book, this great project, to highlight some of the artists in Northeast Minneapolis. So Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the project that you've worked on? Sure. I've been involved in the arts community for a long time, and uh, I just sort of fell in love with the artists. And, and I, I remember what it was like when I first got here in, into this area. And I saw these buildings and they were just huge and frightening. <laughs> and, and they didn't look like anything. They didn't look like artists were inside. And um, when I got the idea for the book, it was partly to kind of show people who might not be in the know what's going on inside there and how hard people are working and what they're trying to do in a lot of ways. So really on the outside was a cold industrial old building from the yeah. turn of the century. And then people would say, oh, meet us at the California building. I'd be like, where is that? Nothing looks like California here. What? <laughs> so it was a lot of just slowly learning and exploration and then discovering that there's this amazing community that's just sort of hidden. And, and then I got to know more and more of the artists. I, as Josh mentioned, I was on the NEMA board. Um, I also coordinated Art of World for a couple of years. I've been in various buildings, uh, first in the Thorpe and then in the Northrop King and now in the California building. Getting to know the artists and getting to know um, them as people and what they're trying to accomplish, I just, I wanted to, um, I wanted to tell their stories. And that's what your book is about, a, a select group of Northeast artists, just several of the many. Yes, I mean, if I had my way, I would be doing this project for the next 20 years and try to photograph everyone. I've ended up photographing about 50 different people, and then due to just monetary constraints and such, I had to narrow that down, and now there's 27 in the book that I, in addition to photographing, also interviewed and then called those interviews down to just um, something that I thought was really sort of interesting and unique about, um, about their story and their experience. How can our viewers purchase it? Well, the easiest way is to go to my website, which is www.sarahwhiting.com, so S-A-R-A-H-W-H-I-T-I-N-G.com. Okay. 
and um, there is a, a PayPal link there, and then I, I mail the book to you. <laughs> Great. And but what? I also, um, I want to mention that I, I, I couldn't have done the book without the support of um, our, our community as artists, but also uh, the support of the state. I got two different state arts board grants, one to do the photographs and one to put together the book um, that allowed me to actually do this. And Josh, how does this fit in with the overall mission of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District, this, this particular project? Well, one of the things we're trying to <clears throat> accomplish is do documenting what's here. Because, I mean, there was, for basically about 17 or 18 years, we were all making things and just working, and nobody was actually taking photographs. I mean, this is pre-internet, so people just had their cameras, and there just wasn't a lot of seeing what we were doing and sort of uh, the media wasn't really following us the way that we sort of saw ourselves. So I think having, we've encouraged any of the artists to, you know, photograph and write and deal with telling our story. So like this really fits into who we are so that it's a historical document of who was here and why would they were doing what they were doing and what they were creating. Because it is, it's fascinating sort of stuff that people don't realize if you work in a cubicle, you know, and you come to Art World, you see all these amazing studios, and you're like, what is going on here? It's, it's surprising to people, you know, so it gives them a little bit of perspective, but this really gives them an idea that we're humans, not these mythical creatures that mm -hmm. were making all these amazing things. They can actually touch the tools that we're actually using, and, you know, it's a fun deal. So, Sarah, do you think this book then ex explains the humanness of the arts community? I do. I, um, I mean, and part of it, I, I have to admit, was really selfish. I get to force these people, these interesting people, to talk to me for an hour or more and um, have me tell them, you know, have them tell me stories. Um, and so when I'm talking to somebody like Chank, who's a font designer, I, I get to hear about fonts in a different way than I had ever heard before. I mean, when you look at a font, or I, when I look at a font, I don't think about how it echoes and how there's sharp barbs and what that means in terms of how it translates into um, our understanding of what that font is saying. And even, you know, down to how they got to where they are. Um, Josh himself talked a lot about um, art school, the fact that it was art prison and what that experience was like and why it was, why he saw that as important to his own development. And um, I discovered pretty quickly that there isn't one route to becoming an artist. There's, um, you know, I thought maybe there's this magic formula, but there's not. Everybody found their own way and they ended up here. And that's so interesting. So they all had individual paths but they're now here in Northeast Minneapolis. Yes. And Josh, can you tell the viewers a little bit about the, the uh, some other ongoing projects that you're doing over here in Northeast with the Arts District? You just started an exciting one with the local newspaper. Right, yeah, we are working with the Northeast, uh, Northeastern newspaper to actually sort of project some of the stories that, are, that Sarah's done and photographs that she's working on. But we've had a newsletter for, I think it's three years, three and a half years, that we've been sort of documenting and talking about the artists. A lot of mid-career artists is what we've been focusing on, um, just because they've been here for 20 years. What are they up to? Where was their development? How did they get here? You know, they're mature. They, they want to figure out how, how we navigate the next section of being an artist. There's a lot of stuff when you're a kid, uh, when you're young and you're starting uh, through programs and education, but when you actually become a professional, there isn't a guide, there isn't a book on how to do that. So that's why we having an arts district helps us communicate with each other and sort of bounce ideas off of each other and mm -hmm. say, oh, you did that? Oh, I didn't know how you market this, or oh, I didn't know how that show worked, or who do you work with? And I've never worked with that medium before. So there's a lot of just, just like any other industry, whether you're in science or, uh, or math or whatever it might be, you have to have colleagues around to sort of build your uh, repertoire of knowledge. And that's what district is important for us and also for the city. We are a healthy part of that, the economy. And we've seen that through their own studies. Um, I think the, the number was $840 million that the arts bring just to Minneapolis. So it's a big amount of money that is being developed by what I call inventors or you know these artists that are trying to do different things that seeing us differently than just being creators. I mean, we are creators, but 
there's no, it's not like when you go to be a bartender, you go to bartender school and then you, that's what you do and you're just making concoctions all the time. This is, you're inventing new things all the time. You're trying to develop um, and experiment with things that nobody's seen before. How do you make this work? So, for example, you're a tile maker, and you make your tiles differently today than you did 10 years ago or 20 years ago? I wouldn't say I make it different, but I'm always trying to experiment with what kind of designs and what kind of how they actually go into buildings and how to make them better and how to help the people who are installing them have better, um, save them time and money, but also how do I make it more interesting than just a plain white tile that you see at any big box store. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like we're trying to give people more options and that's what makes architecture more interesting. I mean, that's what we study historically, what the Egyptians did, what the Romans did. I mean, all those people are fascinating to us today. Who are, are we being the fascinating people that somebody a thousand years back looks at and goes, wow, those people were trying to do something really cool. Well, I think you are the fascinating person that history will look back on, <laughs> as are you, Sarah. And Sarah, you brought up a very interesting point about when you first came here, there were these massive, empty industrial buildings very cold and sterile, but yet now they're, they're full of art and creativity. Well, they weren't empty. They were just unknown to me. I mean, the Northrop King building is probably the most massive arts building. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for our viewers, Northrop King was a seed company many years ago. Yes. So it, it features very tall ceilings, strong, strong floors you could drive a fork truck on. Mm -hmm. And I actually heard once that um, the Northrop King building itself, when Shamrock Properties first bought it, they were thinking about raising it and building condos, and they found out that there was not enough dynamite in the state of Minnesota to take down that building. So what do they do instead? <laughs> so they s have slowly been developing the building. They're still developing uh, it. It's so massive. There are still parts of it that are not yet used, but, you know, Craig Bell was one of the first artists in that building and he was sort of hanging out there by himself. Shannon Joy Potter was there, you know, and so it just built up and built up and built up and it's just amazing to see how it's changed and grown and just strengthened as a community. Yeah, I would hear stories about people would get little scooters and run around in the actual building and, and, and go say hi to each other and sort of hang out. So, you know, I mean, it's such a massive building. Uh -huh. It's just cool. And plus, the history of the community here with all of the, the workers, you know, I mean, that with just the working class that lived and worked here, I think that we're just the next generation of working class artists. I mean, that's what we do. We're always working. So we're not flashy the way that a lot of people think artists are. We are in our studios constantly making things. Well, I'm going to disagree with you because I, I noticed Doug Padilla is in your book, <laughs> and I would say he's a little on the flashy side. Yeah, he is. But <laughs> Which is good. We gotta have flashy, but I, it all helps. Maybe to, just a little. We bit. gotta have a little bit. Yeah, his last uh, his last party in the California building. I've never seen anything like right. it before. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's all fun, hidden stuff. So, but I mean, it, that's what's special about it is that, you know, that it is going on. But we do want to get it open up to the rest of the community to sort of go, wow, this is really happening in our community. We don't have to go to New York or L.A. or somewhere to get this. It's here, mm -hmm. and amazing things are happening here. And it's time for us to be able to open up that and share, share it with everybody. Well, and you two coming on the show today is, is the start of a great beginning to, to share that and to get more people involved. Your book is wonderful. Can you tell us again how we can get that book? Uh, you can go to my website at www.sarahwhiting.com. So S-A-R-A-H-W-H-I-T-I-N-G.com. And before we leave, I'm going to put you both on the spot and ask you to look into the future of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District and give us 30 seconds on what you see that being. We'll start with you, Josh. Yeah, the district is going to grow into a much more mature state where we're actually hopefully be able to showcase more sculpture, more visible sort of features throughout the district so that people can recognize it more and know what we're trying to accomplish. So Franconia Sculpture Park coming in and being a part of that, that's probably an yeah, example. That's, that's the easy way to sort of look at it for sure. We hope that more of the, just the artists that are already here to get them to showcase more and we working through people like uh, organizations like the Franconia will help to get sculptors out there and make it look like an actual district. Mm -hmm. and, and Sarah, what, what is the future in the eyes of a photographer? Well, there's going to be more and more to photograph. But I do want to say, too, that as we move forward, we need to continue to be cautious and continue to make sure that we retain this. The thing about artists in a community is they make it 
more interesting and um, ultimately more and more people want to be there. They want to live there. And then it becomes too expensive for the artists and they get gentrified out. This has happened mm -hmm. to us before um, and you know it's happening all over the country in random places. And I want to make sure that the district itself um, keeps in mind this, this idea this, that, that we have to stay here, that we need to be able to be part of this community and not make it so cool that we have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is the biggest challenge that we have going on. That, Seriously, it's, uh, that it becomes unaffordable. Mm -hmm. Right, well, and, and we understand it, but the tools for, it has happened all over the country, all over the world, and it's a very common feature that goes through any successful um, organization or city or town. And so the question is, is how does the city embrace what they have? And that is a real missing link right now, is the city doesn't know how to work that magic out yet. So we have to keep educating them and the residents need to understand mm -hmm. what's, it in, what's in it for them. And you, know. you sound like a little mini version of council member Kevin Wright because he always talks about how do we keep the art district? How does it yeah. not go away? And we have had really great partners. I mean, there have been people that um, you know, back in the day, Paul Ostro was helping us mm -hmm. a lot with the Arts Action Plan and, and ensuring that we became an arts district. And as you, you mentioned, Kevin Reich, you know, we, we have people that are advocating for us and, and it's important that we keep valuing this enough that we retain it. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, coming down to the studio and telling us a little bit about, about the arts district. Josh, maybe I can get you to come back on some other shows and give us some more education about this wonderful amenity that we have here in the Twin Cities. You got it. Thank you.